Now we are going to proceed with chapter 5 of the Pierce text and we're continuing to talk about extensions and modifications of Mendel's basic principles. So we started this process with chapter 4 and now we're going to continue it with even more extensions to the original principles in chapter 5. Chapter 5 is uh, split up into uh, four major sections and you can see those by the headings in your book um, but just to kind of bring everything back into focus since it's um, been a little bit since we've talked about chapter four stuff we really looked at the um, effect of sex on uh, traits and whether they were linked traits um, or um, and even how sex was determined so now that we're proceeding into chapter five we're really going to be looking at um, a couple of main principles. So everything from genomic imprinting through codominance, lethal alleles, how sex influences inheritance patterns and how certain traits are only going to be um, expressed depending on whatever sex um, it is being expressed in. And then we're also going to talk about epistasis and a couple of different forms of epistasis. So chapter five is packed with lots and lots of material. So spend extra time reading through the chapter and spend um, lots of time uh, making flashcards and trying to get these concepts down. All right, so this uh, lecture is set up very much like the book, so we're going to attack it section by section. The first section in the Chapter 5 um, book really talks about um, some additional factors that can happen at a, at a single locus. So we're talking about single genes in this situation, and that it really has the ability to affect um, the crosses um, or the genetics of the different crosses. All right, so within this uh, section, we're going to talk about the different types of dominance. Um, we'll briefly look at penetrance and expressivity, even, however, we talked a lot about that in Chapter 3 and Chapter 4. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on lethal, lethal alleles as well as multiple alleles. All right, so let's make sure that we have a good understanding and just review dominance. So there's three major types of dominance and um, all of these different types of dominance were really discovered after Mendel made his initial um, discoveries about inheritance. And even with that um, foundational knowledge, Mendel even acknowledged that dominance was not gonna be universal. So there's lots of caveats and different rules depending on the different traits that uh, we were that was actually being um, investigated. So the three main types of dominance are complete dominance, which is what you're most familiar with. So this is where the phenotype of the heterozygote is going to be the same as the phenotype of one of the homozygotes. So this is where our dominance and our recessive patterns of inheritance come into play. And then there's a second type of dominance called incomplete dominance. And hopefully this isn't the first time that you have been introduced to this term. So incomplete dominance is um, where the phenotype of the heterozygote is actually going to be an intermediate phenotype. So it's going to fall within a range of the two major phenotypes. And then codominance is the third type of dominance, and that's going to be where the phenotype of the heterozygote actually includes the phenotype of both of the homozygotes. All right, so we're going to talk about each one of these individually. I'm not going to spend too much time on complete dominance, even though it's outlined here in the top part of this figure, but this is where we have essentially two major phenotypes that we're concerned with and one of those is going to be dominant one's going to be recessive and as the um, the generations um, begin to filter out from the parents to the F1, F2, F3, etc. you're going to get only those two phenotypes so either red or white in this flower example. Now to contrast that Incomplete dominance, which is shown down, shown down here on the bottom part of this figure, is where we see an intermediate phenotype um, actually being expressed. So that intermediate phenotype is going to fall within a range of, our, of the two main phenotypes. So if the phenotype is a heterozygous, um, it's going to fall in between the phenotypes of the two homozygotes. And so dominance is really incomplete in this instance. 
Okay, so our um, two homozygotes are going to be the solid red and the solid white. And then if we get a heterozygote with this particular flowering pattern, it's going to fall anywhere in between red and white. So we get variations of pink. So again, that is incomplete dominance. Codominance is where we see both alleles actually being expressed in the phenotype. So a really good solid um, example of this is with blood types in humans. So our red blood cells are going to have antigens on them and antigens are going to be proteins that are going to be coded for by a gene and that gene is very specific to us individually. So some of us only have the M allele, therefore we only have the M antigen. Some of us only have the N allele, therefore we only have the N antigen. And some of us have the M, M and the N allele both, and both of those are going to show up um, on our red blood cell. So again, codominance is where both alleles are going to show up and be expressed. Um, so the, the MN locus, which is this um, red blood cell that has the two antigens on it, they're going to um, code for those antigens on the red blood cell. Therefore, they don't, that, those type of blood cells aren't very antigenic which means they don't react in the event of blood transfusions. So there's really not a big issue with getting a transfusion and having a really severe immunological reaction to it. All right, so that kind of sums up the, the three main types of dominance just as a review. So let's go ahead and look at an example. Um, so this the example that we're going to investigate is related to codominance, and um, cystic fibrosis is a syndrome that is actually codominant. So just to give you a little bit of background, cystic fibrosis is going to be um, a mutation that happens on one gene, and that gene is called the cystic fibrosis transmembrane conductase regulator, or CFTR, and that gene is located on chromosome number 7 in humans. So this gene codes for protein, and that protein really acts as a gate in the cell membrane and will um, regulate the movement of chloride ions in and out of the cell. So as we look at this um, photo here and examine the physiology of cystic fibrosis, this is what a normal um, CFTR protein looks like. So we've got this big old protein that sets right in the middle of the lipid bilator of the cell membrane. And on the inside of the cell, we've got this big arm of protein that actually works as a plug or can, um, can actually open and let chloride in. So this is what a normally functioning um, CFTR protein looks like. It's going to allow chloride ions to come into the cell and to go out of the cell, which is really key for um, cellular metabolism and function. When we get um, issues with the CFTR gene, like there's mutations in it, then it does not have the ability to code for the most active form of the protein. So we get an abnormal protein, and that abnormal protein doesn't do a good job opening and closing um, the, the membrane. So what we ends up happening is you get a chloride buildup on the inside of the cell. So what individuals have to do that have this type of um, condition, especially if it they if it's in um, a recessive form, is they actually have to um, go through some really intensive uh, therapy, sometimes on an hourly basis. So these individuals. Um, have repeated chest infections, they may lose part of the function in their lungs, they get a lot of um, airway constrictions, and they have lots and lots of inflammation associated with their lung tissue. So this is pretty common. We see cystic fibrosis show up in about 60,000 individuals each year. And what ends up happening is that um, these individuals are actually have to um, go through some pretty intense trauma, like pounding on the chest, um, to actually get those um, arms of the CFTR protein to open up to allow uh, chloride to go in and out. So 
what should happen normally doesn't with the mutated form of the gene. All right, so what does this have to do with codominance? And the answer is, is that um, for the cystic fibrosis trait, it, it can either be expressed as a big C or a little c. Okay, so the big C is going to be dominant and the little c is going to be recessive. So if we get genotypes of the heterozygous form, so big C, little c, or a homozygous dominant, big, C's, big C, those are going to code for normal uh, phenotypes. So we get normal um, pro or CFTR proteins. The genotypes that tend to be affected with cystic fibrosis are little c, little c. And so those are the ones that really have severe blockages and get um, those repeated chest infections and have lots of inflammation associated with it. So with me just telling you those two pieces of information, I'm sure you're thinking, well, this isn't codominant. This is actually a, a complete dominant situation, but it's actually not. So the reason that this trait is codominant is because even if you get um, a heterozygote, uh, genotype here like a big C and a little c, both of those alleles are actually going to go through transcription and translation, so they're going to both be expressed. So because both alleles are expressed, what ends up happening is that the good allele or the big C allele tends to cover for the defective one. So you don't notice intensive um, chest infections or an intensive buildup of chloride. So this is uh, one of those diseases that has gone through um, years and years and years of research and they were actually able to determine that the that the that each allele was actually being expressed so just keep that in mind um, when you come across codominant um, phenotypes as well all right so that gets us through the three major types of dominance, so complete dominance, um, incomplete dominance, and codominance, and we've also shared with you um, just one example of codominance. So in the next section, we're going to pick up with the rest of uh, section 5.1.